So, hi everyone, um, welcome to the next uh, seminar in the robot learning MMAP series. Um, it's a real honour to have Martin Reed Miller there today to give the next seminar. Um, so, Martin has been at DeepMind since 2015 and he's the team lead of the controls team there. Uh, before that, he was an academic like us and he was a professor in Germany, professor of computer science. Um, and if you look at his track record and publication record, it's clear that he's been working in this kind of trendy area of the intersection of neural networks and reinforcement learning before it became trendy. Not many people can say that. They enjoy things after they become trendy. Martin was pioneering it before it became trendy, and I think therefore there's a lot to learn from him. Um, and it's a great privilege, privilege to have you here, Martin. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ed, for this very kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, probably to, to start with what you said, I'm, I'm in that area for uh, nearly 30 years now, starting with my PhD thesis, always working on neural networks, even in the time when, when they were uh, kind of uh, thought to be dead because support vector machines were the big thing at that time. And reinforcement learning for basically most of my career was set as something that only works for mazes. Uh, and uh, we, we basically kept going, going, so I'm really happy that there, the times have changed and I can kind of see how these uh, things come to life and actually uh, are applied. And in, in this talk, I will, will give you a, a, an overview of what we have been working on, what we have uh, done so far, and, and where potentially uh, the future lies. Before I start, I want to thank my collaborators in my team. Uh, Norman Di Palo from here was also a member for a short time, a very effective member, um, doing some really nice work. And I will also mention this during the talk where it fits. <clears throat> so I'm heading the control team at DeepMind. And what we're basically trying to do, we're, we're trying to, to learn controllers in a closed loop uh, control fashion. So that's usually the business of classical control theory where in classical control theory, you would analyze the process that you want to control the system usually, uh, then describe it mathematically by the differential equations, do some simplifications, and then do a, 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 um, a derivation of the control law so that you can uh, stabilize, for example, the overall control system. Uh, in learning, we want to do it in a different way. We not, do not want to specify how. Uh, the controller has to work, but we just want to specify what the controller has to achieve. And the rest should all be learned by the controller, by the agent itself. Now, of course, if this would work, uh, then uh, this could have be great benefits because then we could also control systems that are difficult to describe mathematically, where we don't know the full truth, or to, to just save uh, human engineering time. Um, so. The main criteria that we want to have, we want to introduce as minimal prior uh, domain knowledge. Ideally, we want to have a controller that just works out of a box for, for any system that we plug in. Um, and this is what, because we want to reduce the bias so that the agent should really be able to find the best solution that, that it thinks is the best instead of being kind of uh, biased by the human engineering uh, um, estimations or, or thinking. And we also want, by this, we also want to enforce generality because the less prior knowledge you need about the domain, the more general the controller will finally work. But on the other side, we also want uh, to do uh, reinforcement learning from experience ideally only. Uh, so, um, so we want to be as data efficient as possible while learning the system uh, because we want to directly tailor the controller to the system that we actually uh, observe, and this can only by, be done by directly uh, interacting with the system. And these are kind of contradicting goals. On the one side, we want to reduce the prior knowledge that we put in, and the, on the other side, we want to be as data efficient as possible. And this kind of drives our research on, on trying to find data efficient methods and agents. So the spectrum that we have is basically uh, we're working at DeepMind, and the, the DeepMind mission originally was to solve intelligence. Uh, and our contribution here is to understand this low-level intelligence that is also built in, in humans to be able to have motor control and, and learn it from a baby on to a human and ever have ever more uh, interesting capabilities to do with that body. And we just want to know what principles are driving that. And on the other side, 
uh, even we, if we don't solve it completely and understand all the principles, then what, what we hope at least is to contribute to have a, a, a big and, and, a, and a powerful engineering toolkit where we can solve important uh, real-life uh, control problems that otherwise are difficult or impossible to solve. And in this talk, I will give uh, sketches, ideas, and some pointers uh, to build a data-efficient agent. So all of our work is basically on the is built on the best, uh, cl classical control or uh, classical reinforcement learning uh, framework that has been proposed by Rich Sutton, uh, Verbus, Watkins, and and others, uh, where the idea is uh, basically that we want to learn an optimal controller. So for every transition, for every decision that we make, for every transition of this uh, physical system that we want to control, there is a reward. And what we want is to uh, maximize the expected reward over a certain amount of time or an infinite uh, amount of time. And this now, this framework allows us to, to specify what we expect from the controller so that it not optimizes something uh, uh, with a very short horizon, but over the whole uh, a very long horizon or over its whole uh, lifetime. So this gives us an, a very nice um, description uh, possibility of what we want to achieve. And ideally, this reward that we give is very simple, so it directly uh, expresses our goals. So not a lot of engineering has to go into that. Uh, for example, we can say uh, the reward is zero uh, if we haven't achieved our goal yet and is one if we uh, are, um, and uh, sorry, if the, the reward is zero if we achieve the goal, or is minus one if, if we haven't achieved the goal yet. And by trying to optimize uh, the sum of rewards, we are trying to get to the goal as one uh, as one thing a condition, and the other condition is that we try to get there as fast as possible. So this simple reward function allows us to specify uh, already a, a, a wide range of goals relevant for for classical control theory. And then uh, the typical thing uh, that is common to most reinforcement learning systems is that we learn a value function or a Q function if we don't have a model of the system, which is typically the case. And by iterating through this Q function, uh, we finally, uh, under certain circumstances, we know that this converges and then we learn the optimal Q function. And if we have the optimal Q function, we can exploit this to find the optimal action. So in a discrete case, when we have only discrete set of actions, uh, we would search through the actions in, in, every st in every state and then exploit the Q function to give us the optimal action. Uh, if we have a continuous action space, uh, then we can use, for example, the gradient or sample-based methods to, to come up with uh, the, the right action. So this is basically always uh, the solution scheme in this reinforcement learning agents. And the classical framework uh, basically interacts with the environment, as you see above, uh, then gives the transition to the learner. The learner updates the, the value function. And from that, a new policy is derived. And this works uh, really nicely. So for example, AlphaGo or AlphaZero have been examples. Um, and I show here uh, an example on chess because I find this really uh, impressive. This was done by a, a colleague of mine, David Silver uh, at DeepMind. Um, so chess was a long t for a long time uh, a challenge for AI research until it was solved in 1997 with a lot of search and a lot of heuristics built into this uh, program that could beat a, a world champion. Uh, and now we have a learning system that completely starts from scratch only plays against itself, and it only needs four, four hours to come with a policy that beats every uh, single entity on the earth uh, and being better. And uh, this is one of the big successes or recent successes of uh, reinforcement learning uh, that, that I personally also find uh, quite remarkable. The problem with that approach is uh, that in order to be successful, uh, we exploit the fact that you can simulate chess um, and so you can play a lot of games uh, just by, by uh, doing this in parallel on, on a lot of computers using the power of, of, of Google uh, with all the computers. Uh, then you can achieve this in a relatively uh, small amount of time. However, you need a, a lot of copies of this game. If you want to do this on a real world system, then this wouldn't quite work uh, because then data efficiency is key. You don't want to have play millions of games or want to do millions of trials with a real robot because before you come up probably with a, with a working policy, the robot might be already dead. So one of the, the big steps uh, that uh, also we uh, were proposing uh, in 2005 
uh, was to instead of just using these transitions that you observe once and update the queue function, uh, store all of these transitions because if you think of it, these transitions that you observe, a state, an action, and a successor state, they kind of build a model, a, a sample-based model of the world. And so why should you only use them once to update your queue function? You can use them over and over again. So what you really want to introduce is a kind of a storage where we store every experience that you have and then use it over and over and again. And one of the first, or the first algorithm that did this with neural networks was neural fit Q iteration, uh, which led to a dramatic uh, um, improvement in data efficiency. So I, I will show a, 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 um, an example of that later, but for example, for the card poll, I did it first in my PhD thesis with this online reinforcement learning and used about a million of trials uh, to learn a, a policy for the card poll uh, system, uh, which can only be done in simulation and then transferring it to the real ro robot. And this NFQ algorithm solved the whole system in less than 300, 300 trials. And then this can be applied directly to a, a real world system. And based on this algorithm, a couple of uh, future developments have uh, occurred. For example, we proposed a continuous algorithm for also learning continuous control, which was called NFQCA in 2011. And then DQN, which played uh, the Atari at DeepMind, was based on these principles, uh, extending uh, the algorithm to more to larger data sets. Uh, DDPG was a continuous version, soft actor critic, and MPO and variants. Uh, MPO is a development uh, by my team again, uh, which which not, doesn't use the gradient, but does a, a sample-based method to develop uh, the policy. All those are based on, on the idea of having a memory and explicitly storing. Um, so here are a couple of examples. Uh, in the left upper corner, you see uh, the card poll system, and this was basically completely learned without any prior knowledge, so directly uh, outputting uh, voltages to the system, and the system uh, gets uh, a reward of zero if the, the pole is upright, and a reward of minus one if the pole is not in the upright position. And this was enough for the system, uh, for the NFQ controller, to learn this within less uh, than 300 uh, trials. Uh, we also applied it uh, in a more serious uh, application uh, in our uh, mid-sized robots, uh, learning to dribble, dribble a ball, uh, which was quite a challenge because you're not allowed to hold the ball, but the ball can always uh, ro roll out uh, of the robot. So you have to actively drive the robot in order to keep uh, the ball in front of the robot. Uh, and you see uh, the, the final policy was quite successful. It what was much better than everything uh, that the students have developed so far. Uh, so this was then actually applied, and with that uh, policy, we became world champion in 2007. Uh, I also applied it uh, to autonomous uh, driving, uh, and you, here you see the first, uh, the first trials where the, the steering policy was quite rough. Uh, so the, the one of the developers said this is probably the first time that the car will run uh, fall over with 10 miles per hour uh, because it's just so much uh, energy that you pump in through the steering wheel. But after about 20 minutes, it really learned to smoothly follow the track and the, the controller uh, was learned and, and could replace uh, a de derived nonlinear control law. Um, and then uh, the last example is a slot car racing. This is the, the first example where actually this is learned from direct camera images. So there's uh, no, uh, no explicit vision system involved, but it's only the direct camera images or pixels that go into the learning controller. And at the end, it was able to control the system uh, to drive very fast on this slot car racing system. So, this basically gave the, the roadmap for us, uh, how we want to, to bring these controllers uh, to more and more complicated system. Uh, it, it's a framework that we uh, now call uh, collect and infer, driven by the insight that the data that you collect in that, such an intelligent system is really precious and the data is also true. So this doesn't, uh, the ground truth uh, doesn't change. You can preserve it as long as the system uh, remains stable. And this now allows basically this reinforcement learning problem to formulate it as a, a set of two separate, but uh, of course uh, intertwined optimization problem. The first one is the infer or the inference problem. 
and it can be formulated as such. Given such a, a set of experience that you have, how to learn the best policy, how to get this interference process right so that you get the maximum out of your data. And the second uh, question is, if this fixed inference procedure, uh, if this inference procedure is fixed, uh, what, what data should I sample next in order to make the most improvement uh, based on the amount of data that I collect? And if we get these two uh, questions right, then basically data efficient reinforcement learning is solved and, and all the methods that we develop are kind of oriented uh, towards uh, these two principles. So next I want to go a bit into this uh, problem of, of having uh, doing offline reinforcement learning when you have a set of experience uh, and you want to approve about uh, this uh, on, on this set of experience. And, and there's a, uh, something happening which, which I call uh, uh, the Q-learning paradoxon, uh, and, and this is basically shown in these two pixels, uh, two, two pictures. Uh, the left picture shows if you have a policy that is already that gets you from the start to the goal, uh, already close, very close to the optimal policy, and you always follow it, uh, then this doesn't mean that you necessarily collect very useful data, because Q-learning would completely fail because Q-learning is, is dependent on that you also know what happens left and right of your trajectory. So if you only have the optimal trajectory, then Q-learning will probably overestimate the value of some actions and you, then you fall off the trajectory uh, and then you never would reach uh, the goal. Um, behavioral cloning would work, like imitating the policy that you already have seen, but that's usually not the thing that you uh, want to have because you really want to improve on your data and not just copy something that has been shown uh, from before, in particular in cases when you don't have a good controller that already has a solution, which is the case for reinforcement learning uh, per se. On the other side, you see what happens if your data collection is driven by a random policy, then you're actually trying out in every state different actions, and this is actually uh, a very good uh, data base for Q-learning because then Q-learning can actually find the optimal path. That's exactly the situation where Q-learning is de designed for. Uh, on the other side, behavioral cloning would fail because the policy is, is just random and would not be good, a good example to implement uh, on your robot uh, directly. <clears throat> the challenge is that if you're getting a, a data set, uh, then you usually don't know whether you're closer to uh, the situation one or closer to the situation too. So you ideally want to have algorithms that somehow can uh, adapt to the situation. <clears throat> so um, the uh, challenge is on the one side, stay close to the data. So you have some evidence and you're not uh, estim overestimating uh, the value of a certain action. On the other side, you also want to trust your Q function because only if you trust your Q, Q function, you can actually get better. And one of the algorithms uh, that we uh, proposed recently uh, is a multi-objective reinforcement learning approach where basically these two objectives are um, uh, balanced by a, a parameter alpha. And the first one basically exploits the Q function, fully trusts the Q function. So if alpha is zero, I would fully trust my Q function. Uh, if alpha is one on the other side, I would only follow uh, the policy that I find in the data uh, uh, directly. Uh, and the, the, the catch here is that you can, for both cases, uh, and for, for, for several values of alpha, you can derive a policy, so your policy can be actually conditioned on this alpha, and then you can try out different policies on the real system, and ideally you would have a, a, a policy that fully trusts the Q function, because that's assumed to be the optimal policy. Uh, but if the data is not uh, supportive in, enough, uh, then an, a, a value of alpha um, that is closer to zero, uh, closer to one, would actually kind of be closer to the behavior cloning policy, and therefore you can choose what alpha is the best to actually uh, give you the best uh, policy. And here is uh, an example to, to demonstrate why, why this matters. So here, uh, on, here are a couple of tasks. And the better the value in, in the table, uh, the better the policy actually is. So that's to maximize the reward. And there are, are a couple of uh, offline algorithms 
And you see, depending on the algorithms and depending on the problem that you apply, some algorithms works, work pretty well, but also they, they can terribly fail on other uh, data sets. Uh, on the other side, on, in the right uh, column, rightmost column here, uh, you see the DIME approach, which uh, gives us a, a very high reward uh, in, in all the cases. So that basically uh, does mean that the information is there in the data, so you can get a good policy, but depending on the quality of your algorithm and, and the design of your algorithm, uh, the result might be uh, completely uh, uh, bad or, or nearly as good or, or nearly as optimal as, as they can be. Uh, so it really matters that you're, you're looking at the inference, uh, how to get the best out of your data, uh, and, and optimize the algorithm for that. So that's uh, the lesson uh, to be learned here. Uh, the se second important thing, as I said, is uh, to collect the data. And very often in reinforcement learning, we have a, a reward where, which expresses the task. But we often, uh, in order to make it easier for the system, we often have something that we call shaping reward and kind of uh, try to, to uh, give the, the, uh, the agent some kind of signal uh, to, to improve slowly, to have some idea where the final solution actually uh, lies. However, this shaping reward often are, they use, again, a lot of engineering knowledge. And on the other side, they can also kind of uh, distract the agent from finding the real op optimal solution uh, that we are after. Uh, so the idea of what we are usually doing is called scheduled auxiliary control. And uh, the idea is uh, pretty simple, inspired uh, by uh, what we can observe in babies. So if we want to learn a, a complicated task that has a, a longer time horizon, we probably want to do to learn some easier task first. So for example, if we want to grab an object and put it somewhere, uh, the first thing is probably to kind of touch this object or to kind of uh, make this object uh, swing in the environment uh, before we actually are able to grasp it. And then if we can grasp it, then to bring it to a certain position will probably also require uh, some intermediate steps. So what we do in this framework is we introduce a lot of auxiliary rewards that we think that might be useful without saying that these are actually useful and also specify the final task reward. And then it's up to the agent to learn uh, each task when it thinks uh, it has gotten enough experience to be able to solve the task. So uh, the idea is that all these transitions that we collect uh, are not only useful for the task where we collect, that we try to achieve when collecting uh, the data, but this can be relabeled and the, the experience can be used for all the tasks simultaneously. And this, again, gives us a, a tremendous acceleration in data efficiency uh, that we hope uh, to see. And then the last insight is that uh, complex tasks can be uh, achieved by sequencing uh, these simple intentions and uh, learning to sequence uh, these tasks and then collecting the data is also a, a very important principle that we uh, implemented with the scheduled auxiliary co control approach. So uh, to, to summarize, we have basically, instead of a, a single task reward, we now have a, a book of rewards uh, that, that are arbitrary hints of what an engineer might think is useful. I will give a concrete example uh, just in a minute. Um, then we execute all executions sometimes, uh, all intentions sometimes during learning. Uh, for we, we collect the data and then we share the data for all the tasks and we learn uh, all the all the auxiliary tasks uh, at the same time, either in one big network or in, in single networks that uh, uh, doesn't matter too much, but having using one single network also exploits kind of uh, a, a transfer and, and can uh, additionally uh, uh, push uh, generalization. And then uh, the, the, the second thing, so this would already work if I, all the intentions for all the auxiliary rewards, if I just would uh, uh, call them um, randomly. So this would be the baseline. But there's also something like, for example, if you want to, to stack two objects on each other's, then it's probably also very useful if you first grasp something and then, and then try to, to stack it if you have something already in hand. So uh, the, the second big thing is uh, that we have a, a so-called scheduler that can learn 
to kind of, if it wants to stack, then really kind of first learn to uh, first uh, grasp something and then try to stack in a, in a second approach. And uh, learning this kind of scheduling also uh, that can additionally improve uh, data efficiency uh, by a lot. So here's an example of uh, robotic manipulation. And typically, typical auxiliary tasks are uh, reaching an object, uh, pushing an object, uh, bringing two objects in a certain relation to each other, uh, touching an object, lifting an object, uh, opening closed fingers. And all of these rewards are kind of uh, very easy to define. They are very easy to detect. Uh, therefore, uh, the engineering uh, effort is, is pretty low. And the question is now, can these kind of support the system to learn a pretty complicated task? <laughs> And so you see, see here the robot arm, which is, which is untrained and then just does a random uh, movement. Uh, but then after some time, by, by just randomly moving, it starts to see that it can actually uh, push a, an object. So the intention for pushing an ob object gets reward. And therefore, uh, now if I call this intention uh, the next time, it probably doesn't do something like that, but really goes towards an object because it more and more understands what pushing an object actually means. Okay. But when it's able to actually push an object, it also gets closer to the object. And then uh, after some time, it also learns uh, if, um, randomly that it can close uh, the fingers and then also it can lift objects. Uh, so it, it has learned how to grasp an object and then to lift an object. So then also this intention starts to learn because it gets the reward, the, the transitions are there. And then after some time, it can deliberately um, grasp an object, and once it has grasped an object, it can also bring the objects in a certain uh, relation to each other. So uh, another intention uh, is now uh, already working. And so the scheduler has more and more intentions available that it can choose that actually do something that is intended. Um, there is no schedule, scheduler, uh, there's no um, initial curriculum implied by this, uh, but the scheduler by itself can say, okay, this now works, this is useful to achieve new reward, I want to do this, and then selects this. And then after some time, it has then uh, finally already learned uh, to, to uh, clean up uh, the, the working environment by putting uh, the elements in the box. And you also see that uh, if, for example, if the objects are already stacked, uh, then it uh, can also very efficiently put both objects in the box by itself. So it has developed a, a solution that is very clever, uh, that, is, uh, that it has uh, exploited or has found by, by kind of uh, sequencing actions. And then after some time, it has enough training data so that it finds out by optim further optimizing, uh, this is the optimal solution to, to save the most of the time. And the nice thing, once we have established such an agent, uh, then we can uh, just uh, exchange the robot robotic system. So now we have a, a more degree of freedom system, like uh, with a real uh, robotic hand. Uh, and the same agent as before, with the same setup of auxiliary rewards, now can learn a completely different uh, control policy. So nothing has to be changed. So, so this is a step towards a, a general, a more general agent. And of course, this also works uh, for, for other tasks like stacking uh, with other objects and again uh, with other with other robots uh, as we as we do expect and then uh, our work uh, doesn't stop here so we, we try to continue as I said before we try to find the principles uh, the auxiliary rewards that we needed uh, we used before was basically to push an object or to lift an object but then you can, of course, say, okay, there's already some, some prior knowledge going in because what is an object? And so this uh, simple sensor intentions is an approach where we say, okay, uh, what, what could be the easiest thing? And the easiest thing is actually uh, giving a reward for changing sensors. So giving a reward if you touch something, or in this case, uh, giving a reward if something in your camera image uh, is changed, like for example, uh, the green color ch ch uh, channel uh, moves to the left and to the right. So these are very easy to implement and these are very general rewards and they can still help uh, to find solutions that, that finally lift objects or finally are even able uh, to stack objects. 
And based on these uh, principles, I'll, I'll show a couple of experiments uh, again with the idea. Uh, here we have very, uh, uh, very simple uh, intentions based on sensor information, like uh, the joint angles. So the robot, uh, the, the agent gets rewarded if it, if it has learned uh, to lift uh, a leg, which is relatively easy uh, if, if the uh, robot has uh, six, five or six uh, legs. It's a bit uh, more complicated. Uh, if it only has uh, four legs, then it has to, to bend uh, the whole body. And if, if it has two legs, uh, then this, exactly the same reward uh, leads to a policy that now already has to learn to balance. So this policy is, is much more capable because it all, also uh, has to solve basically this card pole uh, balancing problem before. Uh, otherwise, it would never get the reward. So these, the same rewards that are very simple to implement can have complete different behavior depending on the actual capabilities of the robot. And that's something that we want to see if we want to go towards a, a very general brain that can solve a lot of different uh, environments. And the, also the important thing is uh, that these, by, by having this uh, approach of, of really efficiently re reusing the data and using it for, for all kinds of these simple rewards, uh, the learning times are really uh, relatively small. So we use for, for the hexapod and the quadruped, it took less than 20 minutes. Uh, real-time interaction on a real robot to learn that. And for the fi bipeds, which includes uh, the, the balancing thing, it took 5.6 uh, 5 hours, which is, of course, longer than uh, for the quadrupeds, uh, but is still in a range where you could say you could, you could directly apply this to a real, uh, to a real robot. And yeah, the, the last thing again shows this capability of being creative. So if the robot has additionally arms, then, then lifting a leg is not so complicated. You don't have to balance. You can just uh, move forward and stabilize yourselves on the arm and then lift the leg and get, get the reward. So this kind of shows that depending on, on, uh, uh, on the, uh, the creature itself, uh, there might be very different solutions and this optimization algorithms is to come up with uh, creative solutions for the same problem on different creatures. Um, then once we, we have, or we can have, uh, we learn a, a lot of these things. And of course, one thing is also uh, to, to move actually, which can be measured by the IMU. Uh, and then this is a movement that it has learned for a six, uh, six legged robot. Uh, it also learned uh, move forward on a three legged robot, which uh, looks uh, pretty interesting. Uh, this also works uh, on bipeds, where it now really also uses the arms to be uh, as fast as possible. Um, and that's uh, what I think is also really cool. If you exchange the legs or you do some skaters uh, on the legs, uh, then it's uh, moving forward would ha have a completely different movement because now it, it actually learns uh, to skate. Uh, and if you put this uh, to, a, to something uh, where it ac actually has to achieve a final position, it also learns uh, to decelerate uh, with, a, with the skates uh, by, by learning the appropriate movement. Uh, and again, the reward uh, for, for all these creatures uh, is, is the same in, in all the cases. Uh, and I have, I have uh, reported the, the real-time interactions uh, in the simulation, but to actually prove that this is actually true, so we applied it uh, to a, a real quadruped, uh, and there we, we verified the learning times, so this was learned in, in less than five hours of training uh, a, a gate completely from scratch by just giving this, uh, this reward system. So this kind of is the overall idea that we are, we are pushing towards uh, based on this original idea of storing all the experiences. Uh, the, the general picture is uh, on, on the uh, low, uh, above side, we have still a scheduler that selects the current policy that we want to apply, the current intention that we want to apply. Uh, in the middle, we have what we call the so-called agent states. And this is all the experience that the agent has collected so far and all the knowledge that has been derived from this experience. 
And so far, we have only talked about policies as a knowledge that has been derived from the experience. But you could imagine much more, like, for example, uh, models that predict what happens uh, if I apply a certain action. And with those models, you could, for example, plan a certain trajectory that you have never seen before in order, for example, to make data, data collection more effect effective. Or you could uh, learn uh, new rewards uh, based, for example, on, on some measures like curiosity in order to be even more general. And if you don't have an idea what auxiliary reward might be, then curiosity re rewards that are generated out of the system uh, might give a, another level uh, of uh, autonomy. And so that is currently our our overall agent. And what we are trying to work is on, on all these kind of, kind of learning systems that derive knowledge from experience and combine this knowledge that we have so far, again, to be get more and more efficient with the idea that at the end we have an agent that we plug, for example, to a certain environment and it will just continue to learn and learn and learn, um, for example, a, a manipulation. manipulation. So here are a couple of, of components that we are uh, currently developing. So, of course, uh, better off policy methods uh, like uh, DMPO, which uses a distributed representation of the value function, uh, then better skill schedulers. Uh, we're trying to learn models that can plan ahead or dumpy models that can plan on a more abstract level. Uh, curiosity rewards is something that we, where we hope to uh, explore a, a better um, where we can enhance exploration. And uh, Norman, in his internship, he uh, was showing that the use of, in, uh, of uh, foundation models can also support a lot in doing better exploration, uh, again, with the insight of how the world uh, possibly works and what could be good directions uh, to explore next to, to save uh, the amount of experience that you need in order to learn a certain targeted behavior. <clears throat> So uh, to, to, towards the end of the talk, I want to show uh, two examples, uh, which are a bit more already practically oriented. Uh, one is uh, block stacking, which we had as a benchmark for manipulation. Uh, the challenge is always to have a, a red object uh, stacked on the blue object. Uh, but instead of just using cubes, we also have other shapes. Uh, and other shapes, for example, if you use um, a triangle or so, then you, you, uh, the, it, just grasping it is not so easy, but you have to be aware this is another shape. So you have to turn your gripper, you have to grasp it from the other side. Or if you want to, to stack a sphere on, on a cube, then you have to be more careful. So we want to see whether the agent is also able to develop some, some physical knowledge and to really adapt to the, in, to, to the environment. And for that, we have three cameras. We input the raw camera information. Uh, we also want to that the interaction is kind of gentle. So whenever the, uh, the applied force is too strong, we, we stop the trial. So it has to learn a, a gentle movement. And the previous state of the art was using sim to real uh, and then bringing it to, to the real robot and then uh, collecting a bit more data. And then uh, with that approach, uh, they got to about 80% of situations that they could solve. Uh, and our approach now was we, we uh, was to say okay we know we don't want to have sim to real we want to reduce the engineering effort uh, we really want to just learn from the experience collected on the real robots so nothing uh, nothing else in the system and uh, the approach ran for for uh, 1.5 months on 10 robots so, so about a year of, of data collection on a single robot uh, with this collect and infer uh, architecture. Uh, the controller runs at 20 hertz, has five degrees of freedom, and as I said, we use raw pixels and sensors as input. And, and here you see why, why this is difficult. As I said before, if you want to stack, for example, something that has a, a, a sloppy surface, then of course it always uh, goes down. So you have to, to first kind of uh, try to, to, uh, to turn the blue object before you can succeed in stacking. Uh, Balancing is, is an issue, so if, if the object, the red object, is a bit longer, then you have to find uh, the, right, uh, the right point, otherwise it will just slip again. Uh, if you grasp objects from the wrong, uh, with the wrong orientation, you will never have them. Uh, and if you want to uh, stack uh, uh, spheres or, or, or round objects on, on, a, on a cube, you also have to be uh, particularly careful, otherwise it will just uh, roll over. So there, uh, for 
these are all problems that can be solved by engineering. Of course, there are classical solutions for that, but it will take uh, probably quite some time to, to come up with a proper solution, for if, in particular, if you only have vision as an input and no, uh, no ground truth. And these are uh, the solutions that our agent came up with, and in particular the left one. It gently pushes uh, the lower obje objects until it has the right surface uh, above, and only then uh, starts uh, to stack. So this is a, a pretty uh, clever solution because it, it cannot, it has a restricted degrees of freedom, so it cannot easily turn the blue object, but it always can push it. Uh, or on the middle, it has learned to find uh, the right balance uh, for, this, for this longer object. It grasps uh, the triangle object uh, from, from, the, from the right side, and also the round object, it, it puts it so gentle that it doesn't roll over, but, but really stays on, on the blue object. And this was learned all from data uh, by, uh, by exploiting the data. And for that, I think uh, the, these experience, pure experience-based algorithms or these reinforcement learning algorithms are always thought that they never will work in practice because they need so much data. But I think for if we can achieve such a, a, a dexterous behavior with, with uh, 10 months, and we're still working to reduce that time, uh, then this is a good sign that these uh, methods will eventually work and will have some, some benefits in the real world. Okay, and here are uh, some examples of, of things that we have learned. Most of them I already covered. covered. And the, the, the final uh, experiments uh, that I want to show quickly, we had a, a Nature publication uh, last year about applying these kind of learning methods uh, to a real-world example of controlling a fusion, uh, a plasma in a fusion uh, reactor. Uh, and ironically, this was one of the examples that I always taught my students in reinforcement learning uh, courses that you probably never will do with reinforcement learning, something like a, a fusion or, or, or a fission. Uh, and uh, just uh, it was a fusion area where, where we actually uh, entered. Uh, so the problem is here you have um, a plasma which is, which is really hot, 150 million uh, degrees, and you should avoid that it actually touches uh, the boundaries of, of, your, of your vessel, um, because then it would lose all energy and also could, of course, damage uh, the vessel. So the only thing that is, you can keep this is basically by a, a mag magnetic field. And so the challenge is you have 19 magnets around, uh, around this vessel. The, the challenge is now to how to, to have the right voltages so that this kind of very fluid plasma is kept in the right place. Uh, so keeping it stable is the first thing. And the second thing is that you also want to have certain shapes because some of these shapes might be very useful to finally produce energy. And the idea was if we can come up with a learning controller, uh, then uh, the, the, uh, the researchers there have uh, a lot of freedom, freedom to, to try out different shapes and to investigate the properties of these shapes. Uh, and this would be a, could be a really powerful tool uh, to make uh, plasma research uh, more comfortable in the future. So we wanted to reduce an existing controller that was based on classical theory, uh, control theory, where we, with a learned control policy that only gets the current measurements and directly outputs uh, the, the, the voltages to these uh, 19 uh, coils. And we did this. Uh, with a, a sim to real approach. Unfortunately, our methods are not so data efficient yet that we can directly apply this to the, to the real world, but we have to go uh, via sim to real. But at the end, uh, it's turned out to be uh, very effective. And, and these are, uh, unfortunately, these videos uh, do not load here, but I have a gift that I can show. So this is an example for a very exotic shape. Uh, so here we wanted to control even doublets. So the, the plasma is based in, in, in two parts. And so this was the first time that this was done on this uh, reactor in the real world. Uh, and we even had a, a, and for that, of course, because we, we did it for the first time, we also have a, a new world record, uh, 200 milliseconds, which according to their ex experts uh, is effectively uh, forever. So these are the, yeah, the, the, the time scales on which uh, these plasma physicists work currently. Okay, uh, to summarize, to come to a conclusion, uh, what we are trying, what we're striving to do in, in my team is we want uh, to come to a self-learning general uh, data efficient control agent 
this generality. For that, it is very important that we introduce as few prior knowledge as possible. For example, to finally get rid of simulators, to finally get rid of, of human demonstrations. Uh, and in my talk, I wanted to show how this can be uh, possible and that this is probably also a realistic goal uh, to achieve uh, if we're pushing more and more on the methods. Uh, we have made progress along three major axes. Uh, so improving uh, the autonomy and generality, uh, minimize prior knowledge. For example, these general rewards these, by, by these simple sensor intentions, this is one thing to improve generality, improve data efficiency by better uh, learning methods, by better inference methods, uh, and, and then by that being able to increase more and more the complexity of tasks that we can possibly achieve uh, with this reinforcement learning approach. And um, this covers all the spectrum from understanding the low-level motor control intelligence, which is uh, some important uh, cornerstone for understanding intelligence in, in human, we, we think. Uh, and on the other side, uh, uh, we also hope that a lot of our research will finally go into an engineering toolkit and will be one uh, control uh, development um, method for control engineers. And with a sentence, intelligence is the ability to efficiently and effectively turn experience into knowledge, which is at the basis of this collect and infer framework. I end my talk and I'm happy to take your questions.